Today, we're taking a look at a rare iMac G3 prototype. Most of the public has never seen this before, and we're gonna compare it to the retail version and look at some of the fascinating differences, including a yellow logic board. So if you're ready, and I know you are, let's dive in. Hey guys, how are you all doing? If you're new here, welcome. My name is Crazy Ken, and I have the iMac G3 prototype right here with me in the layer. It's actually been chilling in the background for a while, but now it's the star of the show. Full disclosure, I have barely explored this thing. I kind of wanted to save the experience for all of you guys to join along with me. I don't remember exactly what the previous owner said, but... It sounds like it's not in working condition. Now, what could that mean? I don't know. I've bought some things on eBay, for example, that weren't working, but I was able to fix them pretty quickly and I got them for cheap. So maybe we'll plug it in later and it will just power up and work. If not, well, that's okay. I know some smart people that can help me make it work. But before we test the power up and possibly try to repair it, let's just take a look at some of the cool differences between the prototype and the public retail model. And boom, here they are. You know, the differences are much more apparent when you look at them side by side like this. It's pretty cool if you ask me. So the first big difference that you probably noticed already is that this iMac is extra shiny compared to the original Bondi Blue iMac G3 released in 1998. In a lot of Apple prototypes, this is common and I'm not 100% sure why, but I'm guessing it's to save on manufacturing cost. The other thing you may notice is that it's a lot more see-through than this one. If you look at the plastic here, you'll see there's more housings and there's probably some EMI, electromagnetic interference shielding in there and all that stuff. And that kind of blocks the view on the inside. Now, because this is a prototype iMac G3, it's a pre-release hardware, it doesn't need to pass FCC compliance because it's not being sold yet. So certain things like EMI shielding to prevent it from interfering with other things is not necessary in this stage of development. And I bet you're eyeballing these stickers on the back here. Don't worry, we'll talk about those in a sec too. Another thing that I found interesting, and this isn't specific to the prototype, is that this metal housing on the back, which holds certain components for the video circuitry, it's square shaped. It's square shaped in here as well, but you really can't see it because it's more frosted looking, but it's square in this one, probably because it didn't matter. You don't see it. It doesn't need to have a round look or anything, kind of like the rest of the computer. But the fascinating thing is in the future iMac G3, where you could see that housing, Apple took the time to make it cylindrical, which I think is kind of a cool aesthetic change. Okay, so now let's take a look at some of the smaller details, and then we'll open it up a bit and take a look at that yellow logic board. So here's one of the stickers or labels I was hinting at earlier. Remember when I was talking about the EMI shielding and the interference and all that stuff? This is the warning saying, hey, <laughs> this thing might cause problems. It has not been certified yet. It has not been approved by the FCC. This device can't be sold. It can't be offered for sale. Can't be offered for lease until approval of the FCC has been obtained, which they eventually did, of course. <laughs> but this model, we weren't that far yet. And then there's this sticker here, which is really faded, but it mentions a television receiver and that it's not available for sale in the US because it hasn't been certified. And I'm guessing that's talking about the video circuitry because it's not a television, but there's certain components that are similar to a TV that could cause interference if not built and shielded properly. And beneath the FCC label, we have a property of Apple Computer Incorporated expensed equipment label, and it's kind of shiny and it's got a barcode and some letters and numbers here. So I'm, I'm assuming that this was just for internal tracking to make sure, hey, we have our assets and they're where they're supposed to be. So on this housing, you can kind of see there's an Apple logo etched in there. And I believe there's the optical drive and some other components that are stored in here. And an interesting thing is this port is typically running to the infrared sensor on the front and there's a cable for it. But in here, I don't see a cable connected to that. So that's really interesting. Anyway, we have more regulatory logos and it just says sample only, not for resale, stamped over them, agency approval pending. Some other information about compliance with DHHS rules, which frankly, I don't even remember what those are. Big X on there, just to remind you again, don't freaking pay attention to that stuff. But in the final release, uh, this kind of holographic looking sticker was pretty much the same, just without the 
crossouts and all that stuff. Here's a detail I actually didn't notice until just now. It says assembled in Korea, and that makes sense because Apple did work with a manufacturer in Korea to work on this more funky case design with the colors and the curves, but the final release does say assembled in the USA, at least the revision A version that I have. Another interesting design change is this blank space here. Now on a lot of Apple prototypes, you'll see placeholders for numbers, but they'll usually be left blank. And then later there will be a number in there. And sometimes for serial numbers, they're just blanked out with X's. In this case, it looks like it's just a blank square or rectangle. Maybe a serial number would go there eventually. But on the retail version, this was actually not here. The retail version didn't have a white box and the Apple logo was nudged down a bit. So before we take a look at the inside more, I just wanted to give you another detailed example at how clear the case is and how much more see-through it is without all that extra shielding in there. You can see what I believe is the analog board on here. You can even read the numbers. Okay, so let's flip this thing on its back and take a look at some of the inside stuff, including that special yellow logic board. Certain Apple prototypes do have different colored boards, but the ones I've seen are usually red. So a yellow one is very different to me. I can't say I've seen that before in an Apple prototype. Another interesting thing about this board is that they showed it in the Apple product video for the iMac G3. The retail version was green, but the product video, which was public facing, showed a yellow board. So I think that's kind of fascinating. And another thing I just noticed is that there's no memory in this computer at all. It looks like we have some dim slots here and here, but there's no RAM. So I'm not sure if that's why this thing wasn't working because it has no memory in it, but I can tinker with that later when I try to get it working. Another thing missing is the top housing here. This is where the PowerPC G3 processor is under the heatsink to help keep it cool. And the memory again usually goes here. There's usually another piece that covers this up here. I don't know if it's just missing or if this prototype never had it to begin with. And over here we have another evaluation sticker. The final sticker that was on the optical drive housing here was more Apple branded. This one just says it's a sample for evaluation only. This other label here is blank. There's usually some sort of serial number and a barcode there, at least in my revision A product there is. And probably my favorite sticker inside this thing is EVT revision A PCB right here on the optical drive. So PCB, printed circuit board, it's maybe referring to a board that's inside the drive. Revision A is most likely specifying that it's either the first version of this particular part or it's referring to the iMac Revision A in general because there was a Revision A, B, and C actually sold. EVT is an abbreviation for a stage of prototyping, engineering, validation, test. It's past the design phase and those other phases. Now it's in the engineering phase. Well, the reassembly was rather simple because <laughs> there's only one screw. I mean, normally there's more but I have only been provided with one. And I'm sorry we haven't spent much time on the front. Uh, prototype wise, there's not much different about the front, but with this particular model, we can see a lot of yellowing going on. This thing does not stay on. There's a green sticker on there, not sure why. And yeah, there's, there's a power button missing, but it's okay, we can just stick our fingers in there and uh, press the little button on the board. So before we continue, two things. One, I just wanna say, if you are interested in iMac history, which I hope you are, I did do an awesome evolution episode about the history of the iMac, so definitely check that out. And two, even if this doesn't work, I have a backup plan, so stay tuned. We can still listen for different clues as to what could be wrong or what's possibly working if we get maybe a CRT hum or a beep. That could be some sort of sign of life and maybe this thing can be saved. I know some smart people that can help me fix stuff. Okay, enough gab. I have the power cable plugged in. It's running to a switch that's below the desk and we're gonna turn it on and see what happens. So I'm not hearing any kind of noise from the power switch being turned on. We can try pressing the power button though. Can't fit my finger in there. Don't make that dirty. I need like a freaking toothpick or something. I have acquired a paintbrush, <laughs> something that's just not metal. So let's try it out. No. This thing is showing no signs of life. It's not making any sounds from the speaker, from the tube, LED, not turning on, no beeps, nothing. But don't worry. 
not all hope is lost. So the question is, how do we proceed from here? Well, the first thing to do is just acknowledge reality. I acquired this thing to preserve it and its history. I had the expectation that this thing may never turn on again, so I'm not disappointed, but I don't give up that easily. I have a particular set of skills that could get this thing working again. Sorry, what I meant to say was I have a particular set of contacts of people who are smarter than me that could possibly get this working again. And out of my potential victims, Steve from the Mac84 YouTube channel is going to be the first. And I'm going to bring him to the lair, and we're going to work together to try to get this thing working again. At least we'd like to diagnose what the problem could be. So stay tuned for that. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And feel free to subscribe for more tech episodes coming all the time. I like doing episodes about rare and retro tech, new tech, and of course, scam tech. And if you'd like to support the Computer Clan, feel free to pledge to my Patreon, and you'll get some awesome perks along the way. Thanks in advance for your support. And hey, if you like this episode, you know what to do. Thanks, and I'll see you next time. Catch the crazy and pass it on.